Well, this morning we continue with our series, Finding Grace in the Gospels. And um, we come to a very, very well-known parable. But let me ask you a question first. What do you think is the most important thing that the church should be doing? What is the most important thing that Christians should be about? I've heard uh, several answers. Many folks would say, the most important thing is to tell people about Jesus. And then those people that you tell, tell other people about Jesus, and they tell other people about Jesus until everyone knows about Jesus. Another answer that I've heard is, the most important thing that the church should be doing And then a third answer that I've received is that the church should do what Jesus would recommend to us, which would be to love the Lord our God above all else and then to love our neighbor as ourselves. Because if we do that, if we have that relationship vertically with God and horizontally with our neighbors, What will happen then is we will tell people about Jesus. We will take care of the poor and of the widow and the orphan. In fact, what we will do is we will have God's kingdom come on earth. We will have God's will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. Which is exactly what Jesus has taught us to pray for. In the Lord's Prayer, of course, it is very important for us to pray that God's name be hallowed, and that His kingdom come, that His will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, when people on earth love God above all else, and when they love their neighbors as themselves, guess what? God's will is going to be done. This is God's will for the world. Everything that is good and beautiful and pure and kind comes from God. And if we are connected to God, we can mediate that to this world. That vertical and that horizontal are connected in such a way that it is hard to tell them apart, that they should be indistinguishable. That as we love others, we are showing our love to God. And as we love God, we bring others before Him. So, this answer that the lawyer gives in this parable that we will look at today, in this this incident that takes place 2,000 years ago when he meets with Jesus, this answer that he gives, I think, is very, very pertinent. I think it's something that we, we should all pay attention to, because yes, this is what God requires from us. To love Him above all, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Let's um, turn to our scripture for today, and we read from Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. I'm reading from the ESV translation. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan... 
as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Father God, as we come to this passage today, I know that we are confronted with the example of the Samaritan. And I pray, Lord, that as we are confronted with his example, that we will be confronted with our own inadequacies, our own hypocrisy at times, and our own lack of love for others, which then translate to a lack of love for you. Would you convict us, Lord, of our situation? Do not condemn us. Do not reject us, but convict us so that we can repent and be changed and become more and more like your Son, Jesus Christ. I pray that you would be with us, that you would teach us, guide us this morning. I ask in Jesus' holy name. Amen. There are three parts to the story that we find here today. The first part is an interaction between Jesus and the lawyer. And of course, we know that this lawyer isn't a lawyer that we think of today, someone who acts in, in court cases or drafts legal documents, but this lawyer was someone who studied the Torah, which is the, the Mosaic law. This man was an expert in the Mosaic law. And he studied that and he debated that as his main priority. The second part then is where Jesus answers him in the form of a parable. And in the last part is where he and Jesus then concludes their interaction. Well, let's start with the beginning here. The, this lawyer stands up and put Jesus to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, it has been pointed out to me by someone who is culturally sensitive that in the Middle East, you should not be standing up to speak to a teacher unless he calls on you to answer a question, in which case you will stand up. But mostly, students would sit down and sit at the feet of the teacher who would be teaching them. The lawyer stands up, which means that he is going to challenge Jesus. And he's asking him this question, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, we know that he is himself an expert in the law, so he's not asking from a position of ignorance, but he's asking from a position of, I teach and you teach. Let me hear what you have to say, because I know what I know, but I don't know what you know. Can you share with me? The question then, what shall I do to inherit eternal life, is a question that is very prevalent at the time and was debated amongst the, the teachers of the law and the scribes, all the experts who studied these things. And they had various answers. So he wanted to hear the answer that Jesus would give. But Jesus turns it around on him. Jesus first wants to know where he stands. And then he'll know how to answer him. So Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? What does the law say? You're an expert in the law. You study the law. You debate about the law. You answer these questions all the time. What do you say? What is your position? Where do you stand? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Why did the lawyer answer that? 
It was a good answer. Jesus even confirmed it. But why did he say that? Well, I think what he was doing is he was conflating two verses from the Old Testament law. The first one we find in Deuteronomy 6 verse 5. It says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. This is part of what we call the Shema, which is a prayer that Jews would offer every day. This will be imprinted on their minds. This call to love the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, and might. We see that he added something, he added mind to it. So he didn't take it exactly from here, but he took it mostly from here. But there was some thought put to what he was reading here. There was some thought put to what all the Jews would recite every morning. And then he added something else as well. In Leviticus 19, verse 18, it says, You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So you see what he's doing here, right? He's taking the first part and he's taking the second one and he's combining them. And he's saying out of all the verses, out of all the commandments, I'm taking these two as major. And Jesus commends him. In fact, Jesus does the same. When Jesus is teaching about what is the greatest commandment, he does the same thing. He takes those two verses brings them together. But then, after he's commended, he has another question. He said, no, if that is true, if, if Jesus agrees with me, he's a teacher, I'm a teacher, and we all agree this is what's happening, I have one more question. It says, desiring to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Yes, I must love God, and yes, I must love my neighbor, but who is my neighbor? Who exactly am I supposed to love? Where can we draw the boundary around the people that I need to love? In fact, that God commands me to love. Because remember, there's a vertical and horizontal component. In this verse, 19 verse 18, it doesn't just say your neighbor. But there's another phrase. The sons of your own people. It says, You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but, countering that first part, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So when you read that verse, you can put it together that neighbor and sons of your own people are connected. So who is my neighbor? Well, first of all, my neighbor has got to be another Jew. It's got to be from my own people. But there's another verse that complicates matters. And that is Leviticus 19, verse 34. It says, You shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself, for you are strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Now this complicates matters because if you just read verse uh, 19 verse 18, it just says that uh, your neighbor is someone from your own people. But this verse now complicates matters by bringing in a sojourner, someone who's not from your own people, but he lives among you as the native, as someone who is from your own people. That person who is not from your own people, but is living amongst you as part of your own people, you should love him too, as you love yourself. Which means then he is your neighbor, right? Can you see why this question is more complex now? He wants to know who is his neighbor, because he brought those texts together, but he was also aware of the fact that the sojourner would be counted as a neighbor. But who else? Is there anyone else in that would be counted as a neighbor? Where is this line going to be drawn? So the question is a very, very interesting, very pertinent question to ask. Who then is my neighbor? I want to complicate it just a little bit more 
when I go to um, Sirach, which is uh, writings that, um, that, that they paid attention to in those days, um, Daryl Bach says this. He says, the lawyer wants to justify himself, so he asks Jesus, who is my neighbor? Um, he says, an ancient Jewish book of wisdom, Sirach 12, verses 1 to 4, tells its readers to not help a sinner. So this is some of the authoritative readings that the people were studying and that they were trying to follow in those days. Sirach 12, 1 to 4. Do not help a sinner. Thus, the lawyer's question is really an attempt to create a distinction, arguing that some people are neighbors and others are not, and that one's responsibility is only to love God's people. The suggestion that some people are non-neighbors is what Jesus responds to in the story. Because he's going to tell him now a parable, right? So, in this lawyer's mind, he has a neighbor is someone who is a son of, of my people. A neighbor could be a sojourner, but we know that a sinner is someone that we shouldn't be helping. What about an enemy? What about a disinterested third party? It becomes much more complex, you see. But Jesus is going to answer him with a parable that's going to be so simple and so to the point that it's going to disarm all the excuses that the lawyer has and, and take away all the complexities that he wants to introduce to this question. Who is my neighbor? Now when we come to this parable, this is, the, as I said, the, the middle part. First Jesus talks to him, tells him the parable, and then they conclude matters. In this parable, I'm going to ask three questions. The parable is, is Jesus' answer. But of this parable, I'm going to ask the first question, what is the message of the parable? Secondly, who is the messenger? And then thirdly, what is the implication of this parable? What is the message of the parable? Who is the messenger? And then thirdly, what does that mean? Or what is it, how does it apply to us? What are the implications for us? First of all, what is the message of the parable? How does Jesus answer this question, who is my neighbor? I know I need to love God and love my neighbor, but who is my neighbor? Now we have to remember, and always remind ourselves, that a parable is not a true story. It's not a true event that happened. This didn't really happen. But it's a, a stylized story that Jesus tells to make a point and to bring that point across to, the, to his hearers in a way that they will always remember and never forget. Not only is it a stylized story that is told, but in this parable also, another Jewish uh, way of, of, of communicating was, was used, and that is a chiasm. Chiasm is uh, a structure that was almost like an arrow. It, it goes from a wide base and it narrows down to a central point. Now, when we tell stories in much of the Western world, we tell a story from the beginning to the end, so they run linear from start to finish. And the exciting part comes at the end. It's the conclusion, it's the wrap-up of the story, or it's the, the reveal of what has been hidden all along. Everything that's important happens at the end. But in a chiasm, in the way that the Jewish folk would, uh, would use chiasm structures, is the important parts are not at the end, but it's in the middle. You have the beginning and you have the end, and both of them point to the middle, like an arrow that points ahead. And so the most important part of the story is the middle part. Now with that in mind, let us think about this parable that Jesus tells. There are seven movements in this parable. In this chiasm structure, then, the first movement is a man that was attacked and robbed. The second movement is a priest 
that came and passed by. The third movement is a Levite who also came and passed by. The fourth movement is he had compassion. In verse 33 it says, But the Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. The priest came and saw him, and he passed by. He avoided him. The Levite came and saw him, and he passed by. He also avoided him. But then when Samaritan came to him and he saw him, he didn't pass by, he had compassion. Then, what did he do? The fifth movement, he bound up his wounds. Put wine and oil on there. And then what did he do after that? He transported him, put him on his donkey, and took him to an inn so he could be cared for. And then this, the last movement, he paid for him. He paid the innkeeper to take care of him, and he said, Even if it costs more, I'm going to pay more. I'll pay whatever it takes for him to be cared for and for him to be healed. Seven movements. You see this, this chiastic structure right here. The man was attacked and robbed is one. It corresponds with number seven. When he was attacked and robbed, someone, something was taken from him. And when the man, the Samaritan, paid for him, something was given to him. Taken away in the one, given to him in seven. You see how those correspond. Number two, the priest came and passed by. And number six, he transported him. Those two correspond to each other. Many people say that priests in those days were pretty wealthy and well off. They had high status in the society and, and many of them had quite a bit of wealth as well. The journey between Jerusalem and Jericho was 17 miles. So many commentators think that the priest likely would have had some sort of transportation. But he chose not to transport the man. Yet the Samaritan did transport him. The third movement was the Levite who passed by. The Levite did not touch him or comfort him in any way. And then it corresponds to number five where the Samaritan then bound up his wounds. He helped him. So one and seven correspond, two and six correspond, three and five correspond, and then you have four, which is the, the point of the arrow, which then is the most important part of the whole story. He had compassion on this man. If you look at the right there, the first one is to take from him, then is to avoid him, then to avoid him, and then the fourth one is to love him. And then to help him, to help him, and to give to him. So the point that Jesus is making in this parable is that the right thing to do, the neighborly thing to do, is to have compassion, to love, the beaten down man. That's the message. To have compassion. Now, the second question I have is, who is the messenger? Now remember, this parable is told as an answer to the question, who is my neighbor, set in the bigger setting of loving God and loving others. Loving God and loving neighbors. So, who brings this message of to have compassion, to show love, or to extend grace? Who is bringing this message in the parable? Is it the priest? The man who's an, who is... Uh, the professional religious person here? Yeah? Is it the Levite, who is a semi-professional professional person? Or is it the lay person? Who is the one that is doing what God actually wants to be done? 
When the priest comes, he does not do what God has commanded us to do. He does not have compassion. He does not show love to this person. But, I'm, as I'm thinking about the priest, the situation of the priest, I'm wondering why he didn't do that. Why, did he, why was he not the one to show compassion and to show love? The priest and the Levite, not doing what God has commanded, did not, they did not have compassion on him. And some would say, they looked at the letter of the law and not the spirit of the law. Now, why would they say that? Why would they say that they looked at the letter of the law and not the spirit of the law? Well, I think that the, the key for us, the key um, sentence in this parable, we find here in, um, in verse 30, where Jesus starts the parable off. He says, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. They stripped him and they left him half dead. That's the key. The, the way that people dressed really is what showed folk who they were. The way that people spoke the language they spoke, the accents that they had, was what showed people where they were from. When, you're, when you saw the dress of someone, and when you heard the, them speak, the language they used, the accents that they had, then you could place them. You could know if this was a son of Israel or not. Was this an, an enemy or was this a friend? Was this, where does this person fit in? In other words, the dilemma for the priest and for the Levite who were conscious of the law was, does this person qualify as a neighbor or not? We can't tell because he was stripped naked. He had no clothes on. We couldn't tell from his clothes whether he was a neighbor or not. He was left half dead. He wasn't speaking. We couldn't hear his, his, his language. We couldn't hear his accent to know where he was from. Now, he could have been a Babylonian. Could have been an Assyrian. He could have been one of many nations, many of those who had bad blood between them and Israel. Who, how would they know who this person was? They had no idea. So, that because they had no idea, that then means that they didn't have to care for that person. You see... The, the words of the law was that you should care for your neighbor. But the spirit of the law is to care for a person. So some people say they, 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 they minded more about the letter of the law than the spirit of the law. They use the words of the law to avoid doing what the law requires. They acknowledge that God in His law requires them to love their neighbor but they quibble over the meaning of the word neighbor. They came across someone in need and know that they should help. But they feel they have an out because he may not be a neighbor. They justify themselves. We did the right thing. When they got home that night or that, that weekend, they chat to their friends. They said, what, did, did we, do you think I, we did what was right? And the friends would question and say, well, you know, was he an Israelite? And they say, well, we don't know. We, he had no clothes on. We couldn't tell. We, he, was, he didn't speak, you know. Well, if you don't know if he's an Israelite, you don't know if he's a neighbor. And if you don't know if he's a neighbor, you don't know if you need to help him. You did the right thing. How could you know? Justifying themselves. The man was without clothes. To identify him, he was half dead, he had no language, no accent to identify him. So the legitimate question is, is this man the son of Israel or not? If yes, we need to help him. But if not, there is no obligation on us to show mercy or to show grace. 
The law does not require us to show that to a non-neighbor. This is how this lawyer was looking at things. This is how he comes to Jesus. But Jesus looks at it differently. His question was, who proved to be a neighbor? Who proved to be a neighbor? And the person, the unlikely person who proves to be the neighbor, who is the hero of the story, is a Samaritan. The one that the very Jews despised. We know that the Samaritans was a half race, and they were unfaithful to God, and the, 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 the Jews in Judea, they just, they just despised them. This despised man, this man who was on the outside, was the one that showed them up. Showed them, not according to the letter of the law, but according to the spirit of the law. What does God require? To love your neighbor, to show compassion, to love as God has loved us, to love others. The man who does that is a Samaritan. That's the twist of the story. You see, that's why it's so shocking. Because no one would have expected that. Who was the one that showed mercy? Jesus asks him. And the lawyer says, the one, sorry, Jesus says, who was a neighbor? And then the lawyer says, the one who showed mercy. And then Jesus says, go and do likewise. Go and do like a Samaritan. The one you despise, the one you hate, the one you have no time for, the one that you actually don't want even to know anything about, go and follow his example. Look for a way to do what the law requires and not look for, uh, do not look for a way out of what the law re requires. Look for where you can be a neighbor rather than look for a place where you can be opting out of helping someone who could be a neighbor. This is what Jesus is trying to get across to this man. You need to extend grace. You need to show mercy. You need to have compassion. Not because the law requires it to be done to a neighbor, but because you are doing that which God has done for you to another human being. To love uh, your neighbor as yourself because God has first loved you. So the message is to have compassion. The messenger was the Samaritan, the unlikely hero of the story, the one who should have been the bad guy, turns out to be the good guy. And he extends grace to the person in need. Now, the implication. You see, there is a connection between our love for God and our love for others. Jesus uh, teaches in Matthew, in Matthew records this. He says, you have heard it, it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For He makes His sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. You therefore must be perfect as your fa heavenly Father is perfect. Jesus is, is, is teaching and saying, you've heard it said, love your enemy and hate, sorry, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. You see, the, the, the definition of neighbor for Jesus is not just the sons of Israel or those who sojourn, but also those who are enemies. The definition that he gives is so wide, it is unlimited. This is what Jesus is asking them to do. Their love to others should be unlimited. Their grace that they show to others should be unlimited. 
The moral of the story, the, the impact for us, the implication is, if the Samaritan can show grace to a Jewish person who was attacked, or to someone that doesn't even know who he is who was attacked, if he can show grace to that, such a person, then we, putting ourselves in the place of the Samaritan, should be able to give grace to anyone. Our love and the grace that we give to others should not be confined by the sons of Israel or by those who look, dress like us or those who talk like us or those who believe like we believe. If our love and our grace do not extend to everyone, then we are not being true sons to, of, of our Father who is in heaven. Jesus says, if, not, if you don't do that, you are the same as a tax collector or a Gentile. There's no difference. But if you do extend your grace to everyone, if it's unlimited, if the love that you give, if the compassion that you have is unlimited, guess what? You are doing exactly what your Father wants you to do. The point of the story was to have compassion. Because when we do that, we are the, taking the love of God for us and we're giving it horizontally to those around us. And guess what we're doing? God's kingdom is coming. God's will is being done on earth as it is in heaven. It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> it's the way we want the world to be. But it starts with you and me. If a Samaritan could be a neighbor, then no one is out of bounds. There is no limit to whom we can extend grace to. Jesus, uh, when, as he is going to ascend to heaven, his last words to his disciples, you see, they were, they were still concerned about the sons of Israel, right? They said, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? You see, that was their concern. But he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, sons of Israel, and in all Judea, and guess what? Samaria. Those people that you despise, those people that you don't want to talk to, don't want to associate with, yes, you will go and be a witness to those people in Samaria and then to the end of the earth. Who is excluded from that? No one is excluded. It is unlimited. The grace of God is unlimited. And God is asking you and me to extend unlimited grace as He extends unlimited grace. To be true sons of and daughters of our Father in heaven. We actually see God's unlimited grace on the cross when Jesus, the Son of God, is crucified and He hangs there between two, between two robbers and He extends grace to the robber on His side who said, Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. So today you will be with me in paradise. Unlimited grace to that person who could do no good for the kingdom, who could no, do no good for anyone. He was, he's, on his, he's, he's, he's busy dying on that cross. Without a respecter of persons, we see the grace of of our God through His Son, Jesus Christ. Not only to Him, but even to those who were the enemies of Christ, to those who came, who put Him on the cross, to those who crucified Him, to those people He extends grace. Father, please forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. These are the Romans. These are the oppressors. These are the enemies of the people. God's grace, the grace of Jesus Christ, extends to them. God's grace is unlimited. We see that on the cross through Jesus Christ. In fact, 
Jesus becomes the Samaritan. He becomes the outsider who comes and has compassion on those who are bound by sin. He has compassion on those who are oppressed by sin. He comes to set them free. It's going to cost him like it cost the Samaritan when he cared for this man. It's going to cost him. But he extends that grace. He shows that love because he has compassion. Because he is fulfilling the law of God himself. It's the most beautiful part. Brothers and sisters, let us pray together. But let us, let us remind ourselves that this is what God is, requires from us. To love our neighbor as ourselves. To extend grace to our neighbor. Unlimited. Let's pray. Father God, as we think about the story that Jesus tells... We see a mirror of ourselves. We see so many times how we want to justify ourselves why we will help this person and not that person. Why sometimes we want to walk on the, away on the other side of the street to, to avoid the situation. Why we want to be technical about what the law requires. But what you ask from us, Lord, is to have compassion to love mercy, to extend grace. And I pray, Lord, that even though we fall short so many times, I pray that we would have a desire to do that. That we would not be looking for a way out, for some way, some definition or some legal loophole to help us out of a situation, but we would be looking to say, how can I serve the Lord here. How can I do what my Father desires? How can I prove and show myself to be a true son or daughter of my Father in heaven? I pray, Lord, that you would help us do that. And I pray that as we do that, that those around us would be blessed as this, this beaten down man was blessed by the by the Samaritan. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen us in our resolve to do this. I pray that you would empower us through your Holy Spirit to do this. And I pray that you would be glorified as we do this. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen.